Hi everybody and welcome back to another Legends of Runeterra video. Today I'm going to be taking uh, the time to kind of review patch 1.10 notes. I'm mostly going to be covering the uh, card changes, I'm not going to be really talking about labs or any other um, um, changes to the game, just mostly with the cards and, and sharing my opinion on the changes and the implications of the, um, I guess, uh, decks that these cards are going to be able to fit into and and stuff like that. So yeah, let's let's start out here um, with this little note here. I just talk about kind of the changes in 1.10 and then also what they're going to be doing in patch 1.11. And we can see here that right off the bat we um, are going to get changes to Hush until next patch, which is a little bit disappointing to me because I think it is a sort of um, hindrance to the meta at the moment and and is is limiting the viability of a lot of mid-range decks and a lot of buff decks like buffing up decks like Braum. Um, yeah, I would have liked to have seen that this patch, but we're not going to get it. And then we can also see that it looks like Aurelian Soul may get a little bit of a buff as well, which I don't know that I necessarily agree with. I think he's a pretty strong champion, especially uh, paired with Trundle in the mana ramp. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and then, yeah, buff to Grandfather Rummel, who definitely needs a buff. His 8-drop cost is awful, and um, his, I guess, four, he's granting 4 health to a another unit at that point in the game. It just feels really bad, and I haven't really seen anybody play it in, like, an actual viable deck that, that's competitive. So, um, yeah, any sort of buff to Grandfather Rummel, I think, is going to be appreciated and could go a long way. So we'll see kind of what happens with those, but... Um, yeah, let's get on to, I guess, this patch and the the changes that we have. So the first one, right off the bat, the champion, Ezreal. Um, you need to target enemies eight times in order to level up Ezreal. It is now being changed to you need to target enemies ten times to level up Ezreal. And I've got some mixed feelings about this because, it, like, right now in the meta, you definitely see Ezreal TF. You don't see so much Ezreal Karma anymore, but you do see it every once in a while. The problem with, I guess, Ezreal and these sorts of decks is that it is fairly easy to level him up that's why they're changing it to 10 plus times right they're making the the level of condition harder targeting um, you're limited to kind of spells that you can use to target enemies with and um, in certain decks and in certain um, region matchups it's easier so for example Ionia is pretty easy to to get this level of condition because you've got a lot of targeted spells and abilities like concussive palm you've got steel tempest from Ionia uh, just a lot of things to work around and Bilgewater the same thing you've got like make it rain that counts as a targeted ability you've got parley um, just a ton of different targeted spells that you can use and combine with Piltover and Zon. Now the problem with this is that um, leveling up or um, um, making it harder to level up Ezreal is kind of bad for other regions. If you ever want to build Ezreal in other regions that don't have quite as many um, targeted abilities, we're kind of limiting now Ezreal to basically those two other regions, Bilgewater and Ionia, in order to level him up, which kind of sucks. Um, I've built in the past a Shadow Isles Ezreal deck, which has been super fun. Um, but but you don't have as many targeted abilities. You're basically got Vile Feast. I guess now they've got um, Encroaching Darkness and and um, a couple others. But for the most part, um, we are now limiting Ezreal to be viable only in certain decks, which kind of sucks because that 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 limits his variability, that kind of limits like the fun factor of Ezreal. Any time where a champion can fit into multiple decks and feel good, that is, that's kind of what I like to see in a champion. Where we're limiting Ezreal now to certain archetypes, that feels kind of bad to me. It, it takes the fun factor out of him for me. So um, he definitely needed a nerf. I don't know that the direction that they took is necessarily the right one. But then again, I don't really know what you would do with this besides, you know, actually doing an overhaul on the card and changing it. So um, I think the, the buff was needed or the nerf was needed. But at the same time, I feel kind of sad that that putting him into other decks now probably isn't going to be viable. All right. So let's go on here. Lee Sin. Lee Sin was changed from a 6 cost to a 4 cost. 
he his health went down from six to four his power stayed the same though which is pretty cool and so overall oh and and you need to cast a plus spells now instead of seven so i'm um, a little bit of a nerf there but overall the card looks pretty good um overall the card looks like it's got a buff he retained the same amount of of attack which is cool you can get him out um the cool thing about this as well is that his ability has a barrier and challenger attached to it and so if you kind of build these spells around around Lee Sin, it's actually really hard to kill him. So even though you have the um, reduction in health, it doesn't really hurt him that much if you're building decks around Lee Sin. Um, really the only thing that can get rid of him is like a Vengeance or Ruination or whatever if you build the deck properly. It's really hard to get rid of Lee Sin. You can get him out earlier now. It looks really, really good. Um, yeah, overall, I think this is an awesome card, and I'm pretty excited to build decks and and different sort of concepts around him. So having Lee Sin in the deck is just going to be a lot better now, because his champion spell is going to be turned to Sonic Wave instead of Fury of the Dragon, which is awesome. This is, you know, just more spells, easy burst speed spells that can be available to you if Lee Sin's on the board. Um, this Sonic Wave basically counts as like two spells, because you're creating a fleeting resonating strike in hand once you use Sonic Wave. So yeah, just the synergy is a lot better. So overall, this is a pretty big buff to Lee Sin and kind of his overall viability in decks. Now, because he does need to synergize with with spells, there's still a certain, um, I guess, kind of deck that he needs to fit in. So he does, is kind of limited in the decks that you can um, use him in. So um, there's that, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> All right, so now we're off into followers and spells. So the first change here we have is War Chefs. Um, a pretty big, um, I guess, a deck, a very popular deck, I should say, that's running around in the meta right now is Lulu um, Demacia, some sort of Lulu Demacia, whether that's Shin or Fiora or, you know, um, support. And War Chefs is a super kind of oppressive card early game because he's really, really hard to get rid of. So um, a 2-3 stat line that can combo into things like the Fleet Feather Tracker is like super oppressive. Um, because basically if the... If, if um, they if you only have one card out and they've got War Chefs and Fleet Feather Tracker, they can take out your card and not take any damage themselves and and um you know keep their cards alive which has been super oppressive it kind of narrows your board and makes it really hard to recover from early game um yeah so this is basically just countering the cards that the war chefs can trade into so if you do have you know two cards out you don't want both of your cards to die this is basically how they are I guess protecting your cards on your side of the board a little bit better. Um, it's really hard for the War Chefs now to trade really into in the unit, so you can basically be assured that your units are going to survive the War Chefs attack now, which is super nice. Um, he retains the three health, so he's not completely gutted, but it does make. I think this is a solid nerf to to this card, and um, I think it's going to help people kind of. Um, be able to to survive early game against decks that include the war chefs um yeah he's pretty he's been pretty strong for a long time now especially paired with fleet feather tracker so i'm pretty happy about this change to be honest all right let's go down here so flash of brilliance so it's being reverted from a four cost to a three cost so a couple patches ago heimerdinger was pretty oppressive because of his elusive units that could be created from uh burst speed flash of brilliances that you could kind of store into your hand and then just you know unleash all at once so um when heimerdinger was changed his turret drops were changed as well so a three cost doesn't produce an elusive anymore it creates a fearsome and now i believe it's the six drop that creates a um elusive unit and so really it didn't need to be changed at that point um the the flash of brilliance because it wasn't producing the same types of units right and it was kind of awkward basically to include flash of brilliance into any deck um, besides Heimerdinger, and nobody played Heimerdinger really anymore anyway. You don't see him very often, and so Flash of Brilliance pretty much 
well, the combination between that and the change to Heimerdinger basically made the two of them together um, unplayable. Nobody wanted to play them anymore. So I think this re revert is probably for the best. Um, you might be thinking Heimerdinger is going to come back into the meta, but I don't know. I don't know if that's necessarily true. We've got a couple of things that counter Heimerdinger now with new Targon like Hush, for example. So I think the revert's fine. Um, this also allows you to include Flash of Brilliance in other decks. So, for example, I would create or I would use Flash of Brilliance in a lot of my Teemo decks with um, Puffcat Peddler, just because you can get two spells and it's it refills your mana and um, yeah, it just is a pretty good spell to use in Teemo decks to get more mushrooms into the into the enemies deck. And this is just kind of a buff to to a lot of those decks that are trying to spam out spells and get units out, even with like the um, Eye of the Dragon, things like that. Lee Sin as well, I could combo into this pretty nicely. So um, yeah, overall, I think this is an okay change. And and I'm sure that if it seems oppressive, if Heimerdinger comes back into the meta, then they can revert it back again. All right, Overgrown Snapvine, kind of a meme card. They are, it looks, trying to increase its viability here. They're increasing the power from four to five. This is kind of an interesting change just because by this time in the game, unless you have kind of a fish, finishing card to put onto Overgrown Snapvines, it's not going to really matter that much. Um, either the enemy is going to be able to block it or not. The five extra damage doesn't really do much for you. So how many units have 5 health, right? I mean, I can't really think of a ton right now that this is going to now be able to trade into. I'm sure there are some, but this is round 7 that you're putting this out, so the game should be ending pretty soon anyway. Um, yeah, it just feels kind of awkward. And it still needs a finishing card, so you're replacing every card that you put besides your champions down. Um, every unit card, every summoned unit is going to be turned into the overgrown snap line. So it is possible to kind of overwhelm your enemy with these. But unless you have like an overwhelm or elusive, you're not going to be making contact with the enemy nexus anyway. And yeah, it just seems kind of like you're trying to overwhelm them. Now you got more power. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know that the change, like the change from four to five power is, um, I don't know that it's that um, influential on whether or not you're going to win the game at that point is what I'm trying to say. Basically, you need to pair this with like pack mentality or, or you know, like over over other overwhelms. Um, just seems kind of like an awkward buff to me. I don't really think it's going to change much to be honest. All right, um, let's go down here. Crackshot Corsair. So she's getting a buff to her health stat. She's going from one to two health. Um, this is kind of an interesting change to be honest. So the one health stat line is pretty sad. There's a lot of things that can take out the Crackshot Corsair before she gets a value in. A Vile Feast, make it rain, parley. Um, yeah, Withering Whale, anything that does one damage to these units. But um, she didn't really trade into anything either, and so you were kind of punished for putting her down the first round. If you're if if the enemy drops a unit that had one two right, then she she couldn't even trade into them very efficiently. Um, this makes her a little bit more viable and, and able to trade into units. Now, I was already kind of seeing Crackshot Corsair in a lot of decks, like Misfortune Gangplank decks uh, right now that are running around. A lot of them include the Crackshot Corsair anyway, and they actually do quite a bit of work. Um, yeah, so when allies attack, deal one to the enemy nexus. This is just kind of like a plunder procker, um, and she's pretty good at it already especially against certain types of decks so i think this is actually a pretty solid buff but it might like we'll see how oppressive this is going to be i think she might be now an auto include in these decks um it's going to be kind of hard to get rid of her efficiently and she's pretty much always going to get at least one proc of her ability onto the onto your nexus or the enemy nexus whatever um so yeah pretty solid buff and i think she may be an auto include now in plunder decks all right Let's go down here to the Jagged Taskmaster. So she is being reduced in cost from 3 to 2. Her power and health are also being reduced by 1. So she's a 3-2 now, an epic card. Um, so the 3 cards, let's see. I, I don't really know how to feel about this. I suppose the, the thing is, right, she's granting 1 cost allies everywhere, plus 1 plus 0, right? And so what this is doing is allowing you to play her on curve with units like Crackshot Corsair. 
Um, you do need to plunder before you can play her and get her ability out, but because, like, they're trying to play her on curve with one cost units, right? Overall, I don't know that this matters that much between, you know, a, a three cost and a two cost. You're going to get, I guess, you can, it's possible if you've got more multiple Jagged Taskmasters in your hand to get multiple down on the same turn and granting, you know, even more power to your units. Um, so I guess it does reduce kind of the plunder cost, the innate plunder cost of this unit just because you can play more in a round. Like on turn four, you can play two of them. So there is that, and you can get multiple buffs on your one cost units in the round so overall um that's pretty much the only sort of difference i can see i don't know that it necessarily has a huge impact on her playability and in general these sort of one cost decks are kind of meme anyway and don't really make it into the meta they're just for kind of fun so we'll, we'll see how this affects that but for the most part i don't really expect it to affect her play rate too much i think people are going to mess around with her but but yeah, I'm going to stay basically the same. All right, uh, the Yordle Grifter. So create a warning shot in hand, Allegiance Nat 1. So, so now the the Yordle Grifter, both of his abilities are now dependent on the plunder. So before you would get the warning shot in hand automatically, now you have to also plunder, or get the Allegiance, sorry, not plunder. You have to get the Allegiance proc in order to get the Yordle Grifter's um, warning shot and to nab one. Um, yeah, so definite nerf to this card. He's going to, a lot of times this card was played in decks that were, um, like you didn't necessarily need to rely on the allegiance to get value out of it, right? So this was included into like Riptide Rex decks, especially, um, where you're guaranteed a warning shot and a, and a plunder outlet for for Riptide Rex, so that's not going to be the case anymore. So this is basically, you, you're going to need to run this in Allegiance decks in order to get the full value out of them. Um, so this is also a nerf to Riptide Rex decks uh, and to a lot of other decks like uh, Sejuani Plunder decks that are that have been used in the past. So definite nerfs to those. Um, the card did seem kind of powerful. Um, and Riptide Rex did seem powerful. I think this is a good way to, to nerf Riptide Rex indirectly as well. Um, overall, I'm not too upset about this. Um, anything with NAB as well is somewhat tilting anyway, so it's kind of good to see them limiting the power of these NAB cards as well. So I'm not too upset about this. Alright, and it looks like the last card here is Cygnus the Moonstalker. So he is getting a buff in both power and health, so a one up in power and one up in health. This is awesome. Um, yeah, I didn't really see him that much in any deck before this i think he's going to be included now it's a lot harder to get rid of a three power unit than it is to get rid of a two i mean just things like mystic shot are are very prevalent and um the ability now to survive through that is great he still dies to things like grasp of the undying um and but like the ability to put down a six drop and not trade it into a two cost to spell is really really good um because now they have to trade into it basically with a five cost spell so it makes it a lot less it, it feels a lot less bad if he dies to a grasp of the Anion compared to like a mystic shot so overall this is an excellent buff um he's kind of turning into a late game elusive finisher if you put it onto a five cost unit that you put the round before so something like swain potentially as a champion you could put out uh, grant him elusive the next round with Cygnus the Moonstalker and, and get how much damage is that? If he's not leveled up, you would get 11 damage onto the enemy Nexus on turn six, which is, which is seems super powerful. Just so, like if they don't have any way to block it, the elusive units. So um, overall, I would say this is a well um, needed buff for this card. I'm kind of surprised that they decided to change Cygnus the Moonstalker before they changed something like Hush though. Um, I think Hush is a lot is needed a lot more at the moment if you're going to change Targon cards. Um, but overall, I think this card is going to be pretty cool now to use. You're definitely going to... He's an epic card, so I mean, he should be kind of powerful, and he wasn't. So, um, yeah, I think he's going to find his way in a lot of decks. Not even just Nightfall decks, he's going to find his way into, into other decks as well that just need kind of an elusive game-finishing card. All right, yep, so I think that's about it for this. Oh, overall, I'm pretty happy with these changes. None of them seem awful to me.
Um, I'm definitely going to try some of these out, like the one cost decks that I made in the past. I'm going to try out the Crackshot Corsair and Dragon Taskmaster with them. Um, don't forget as well that they released Monkey Business as well. So this is kind of like a buff to Monkey Business as well, kind of reliably getting these these uh, monkeys out. Um, these uh, powder monkeys and and getting more damage onto the enemy nexus and they're also one cost units as well so so the um, synergy between that and jagged taskmaster is pretty cool as well so I'll probably try creating a deck with with monkey business and jagged taskmaster and crackshot corsair um, I do that first and then follow that up with Cygnus the Moonstalker who hasn't made it into any of my decks yet. Alright, yep, that's about it. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel, and we will see you tomorrow. Thanks.